much because for so long they've wanted to view themselves as the voices of religious liberty, the constitutional purists, and they recognize that they can't have it both ways. So I really like to see us sowing that kind of discontent within the right. In similar ways, I think uh, uh, discontent has been sowed within the left in prior times, and uh, it's causing a kind of reevaluation. And I'm hoping it can be just a part of the ultimate collapse of this bizarre kind of superstitious right wing nationalism and its fight to redefine us as a Christian nation with this kind of Christian history in a very theocratic way that just runs counter to everything that's true about the founding of the United States and its place, uh, at least ostensibly on paper, as a mm-hmm. secular nation. Mm-hmm. It's, it's funny you say that. And Steve, uh, I'm a, let me say this one last thing, then I'm going to let you um, go with your, your question. We actually had um, Andrew Seidel from the uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation on last week to talk about his book, which it speaks to that very point, fighting against that um, that notion that the United States was founded on a um, you know Christian principles, and that was a uh, fascinating um, talk. It, it, I think when you it, it's interesting the reception that we got from that video because what I'm get, or what I'm seeing is that a lot of people aren't really familiar with the truth of how the nation was sort of founded, and they're they're getting this sort of whitewashed story of these Christian principles that are tacked on after the fact. You know, looking back, all the the founders were you know believed in God, but if you look at what actually happened there, it couldn't be further from the case. Andrew's actually a friend of mine, and uh, he came to us right away when he saw the activities that the Satanic Temple were doing. And I think it speaks to the integrity of the Freedom from Religion Foundation that they could recognize us as a religious voice and also see that when we were going into the public square, we were very clear that we were not opening the door to religious displays whenever we were asking for a religious display to be in place because we felt and still feel that it's probably not the best place for it. You know, if if you're going to have to accommodate all religious voices. And uh, we were very clear when we were seeking to put up our Baphomet monument in Oklahoma and then in Arkansas that if the Ten Commandments monuments weren't there on the public grounds, we would withdraw our our Baphomet monument or our claim to have a right to put a Baphomet monument there. We'd stop the fight because what we were looking to avoid more than looking to achieve was the appearance of a single religious viewpoint, having that power and authority uh, of having exclusive privilege on public grounds. We were asserting or reasserting that we're pluralistic nation that respects diversity and uh, and the, and holding the government to the standard of remaining neutral on those kinds of questions. You don't want the government taking ownership of religion to the point where they dictate what is appropriate religious expression. And the FFRF understood that immediately and was willing to accept us as plaintiffs in these kinds of cases where we were testing these things out. And in some cases, they even reached out to us to. Uh, inquire if we were interested in putting places to that test. Uh, Bell Plain in Minnesota, this small town where in a park, somebody had put up a, what was supposed to be a veterans memorial. Uh, it was this image of a cross with the silhouette of a soldier kneeling near it. And um, somebody complained to the FFRF and said that this you know, was clearly a, a religious monument and it needed to come down. FFRF wrote to the city council, told them that this was in violation, and the city council agreed to take it down. And then the Alliance Defending Freedom came in, uh, found a local, went to uh, went to a city council meeting, and they proposed what they thought was this kind of uh, perfect argument where they said they could open up the, those same grounds as a public forum. And as such, it would just be discriminatory to uh, keep out religious voices. You know, it would be an open forum for 
uh, a limited open forum for monuments that were commemorating soldiers who died in combat or whatever. So the city council, they approved this, said private donations of monuments are acceptable within these parameters. And uh, of course, they can't discriminate regarding which religion. And uh, FFRF, you know, wouldn't have anything to say about it. And the ADF was openly gloating about this. They were, you know, they were saying that the FFRF came in, kicked religion out of the public square, but by God, they were getting them back and, and they, they couldn't do anything about this. It was probably Andrew who sent me the email and just said, well, you want to put this to the test? And we, we did. Um, we came up with a monument design within their parameters. We got it approved. Um, the, the, the city council approved our monument design, said we could have this monument up there for at least a year, uh, at which point I guess they were going to reassess whether they wanted these these grounds open up as a as a uh, public forum or not. And then uh, they waited till we had our monument constructed and we were actually reaching out to them to figure out when we could take it there and and uh, and leave it on the grounds, do some kind of ceremonial unveiling of this of this monument on the grounds and then they said they changed their mind they're closing the open forum they they took down the Chris, christian cross and uh and now we're going to sue them um some people have complained and said that's uh, vindictive on our part but we also don't want a situation where these places are simply bluffing or feel they're calling our bluff and just waiting to see you know, at our expense, wait for us to build our monument and only then close down the open forum. Um, mm -hmm. So that way we've kind of changed the changed the argument. Our, our lawyer, uh, one of our lawyers, our primary lawyer, went to a uh, ADF seminar and um, he just wanted to see what they were talking about. And they were talking about us uh, through the whole thing. They were deeply concerned that they had done so much work to bring religious liberty into the public square, to make these arguments for the inclusion of religion, and that we were becoming unintended beneficiaries of that. And they, at, at that point, they didn't know how to handle it. I don't know what kind of, uh, what kind of arguments they're trying to come up with now, but I think just, I think, uh, you know, up until very recently, they were wanting to make the argument in court that we aren't an authentic religion, that we're just satire. That was the entire defense in Arkansas against our Baphomet monument. Uh, but now that we've gained IRS recognition, they, they've had to scrap that entire argument too. Yeah, that's the best way to go is beat them at their own game. Um, Steve? Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of things you're saying resonates personally with me. I, I actually grew up in Southern California during the Satanic Panic literally during that time back in 1983 i believe it was if you remember the mcmartin preschool case uh happened in a little sit town called um, i think it was manhattan uh beach which was a little bit north of uh, redondo beach and this was a preschool that was being charged with satanic ritual abuse of children they investigated for i believe a little over half a decade didn't find anything but this led to numerous talk show hosts talking about these topics back in the day. Sally Joseph Raphael and Gerardo Rivera were prevalent in, in promoting this narrative, spreading widespread panic, um, especially a little bit later on after I graduated high school. Um, they produced, a, I was called a Devil Worship, um, Exposing Satan's Underground was a thing that uh, Gerardo Rivera did. And uh, it basically was trying to, to promote this narrative that uh, there was messages in heavy metal music. Now, I happen to grow up on heavy metal music. Back in my day, I listened to Black Sabbath. I still do, actually. I uh, listened to Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne. And I was very much into cult symbolism. I actually liked the motif. I actually liked the way Theban, you know, the witch's outfit looked. I liked the way the ruins looked. I liked the, the, the greater key of Solomon and those types of, of symbologies. And because of which people viewed me different. People thought that I was satanic during those those years because, of course, the satanic panic. So nowadays, though, these things are more much more mundane. And I'm wondering, have you seen the the, the turnaround, the backlash that from these types of things back in the 80s to now, whereas people have become to the point desensitized to you see types of um, symbologies, and now it's almost comical when people say things along the lines of like Ozzy Osbourne satanic or Black Sabbath satanic. Which, by the way, they started as a Christian group. They're all they all actually are, are religious. They're all theists, believe it or not. Um, 
do you think nowadays that people are like like Kyle said, having this reverse narrative that they're now recognizing that religiosity might be the, the danger and not uh, necessarily people that happen to like music that deals with satanistic tones or overtones or symbologies? Well, well, that's certainly where a lot of people are coming from who immediately embrace the satanic temple. And in, in a way, we are the backlash to that. You know, there were a lot of people who grew up in our time being told that the things they loved the most were satanic. And after a while, they believed it. You know, uh, one of our guys in in Detroit uh, is in the documentary talking about how he played Dungeons and Dragons all the time. And he loved heavy metal music. and he was very much aware that there was a social campaign against everything he loved the most. And they're telling him that all of this is satanic. And after a while, he just thinks all the better for Satanism, you know? And at the same time, he begins to see these accusations against the church, who are, of course, spreading superstition and malicious lies and the witch hunt against presumed Satanists also covering up the rape of children. And it doesn't take too much more to convince somebody of the legitimacy of our point of view on this when you have that kind of history. So in a way, the satanic panic, and then now this really kind of realization of the theocratic coup in the United States have been these kind of two elements that have helped birth this robust satanic movement that I don't think is going to go away. But what's really interesting is to think what this means to the younger generation who, who just don't understand how dangerous it used to be to identify as a Satanist, even in our own lifetimes. They, they have no sense of the satanic panic and how they, they have this moral outrage uh, against uh, different things that we decry as well, but their thinking on the solutions might be really different because they don't really know what it means to be oppressed by the attribution of Satanism. For instance, you have a real kind of anti-free speech movement, and uh, some of the younger people, you know, who who come to the Satanic Temple, you know, they'll, they'll be calling out for the suppression of right-wing views that they disagree with um and they want more restrictions against uh against what they deem as hate speech which isn't necessarily wrong as long as you can come up with uniform standards that can be evenly applied and fairly um but you don't want to you don't want to jump in too hard in a way where you allow some kind of oversight agency to determine uh, on a case-by-case basis what they do and don't like and will suppress and what they'll allow. Because the fact of the matter is, is uh, even within the lifespan of the Satanic Temple, things have changed so dramatically. But when we we would first try to do anything, you would see other religious organizations claiming that what we were trying to do was hate speech against them. And it's not always clear who the minority voice is. You can say, you know, we're just looking out for the minorities, but it's like, well, who's the minority in a case where it's like the Catholics complaining against the satanic temple? Uh, they'll, they'll say we're not a legitimate uh, minority voice. We're just anti-Catholic. Right. Um, and there's also those kinds of questions when it comes to, uh, heretics of different stripes, uh, my heart goes out to the ex-Muslim heretics. Uh, they're usually shit on from all sides, you know. And are they a minority within a minority, or do we consider them assimilated into the broader non-Muslim population who are then denigrating uh, the religious minority of Muslims, right? When you have characters like Ayan Hirsi Ali or, or Maryam Namazi, um, decrying what they felt was an oppressive environment that they you know may have grown up with in, in, in Muslim culture or whatever else. It's not always clear. So you have to be very circumspect when you're, you're you're arriving at these issues. So it's interesting to me to see a younger generation already so uh secure in their identification as Satanists that they don't see a real danger 
and that kind of thing. 